Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, dear guests, dear friends. Welcome to this panel discussion on the state of uh, democracy in the Western Balkans. Uh, I am Blerta Hoja, Program Officer within uh, International Ideas Regional Europe Program, uh, and I'm pleased to moderate this panel today. Uh, as you know, International Idea uh, analyzes and tracks democracy trends around the globe in uh, some 173 countries through a complex and consolidated thorough methodology on which we will hear more uh, in, in a few minutes. And today we would like to zoom in into the Western Balkans to see um, where the main trends are for the region uh, and what's coming up next in terms of democratic consolidation. Uh, we will do so by um, uh, hearing from a panel of distinguished experts, which I would like to thank for joining us here today. Uh, we will hear from uh, the European Union's perspective on the importance of uh, democracy in the enlargement process. Uh, we will hear from my own colleagues from International IDEA, um, uh, we will hear from my uh, colleagues on uh, the specific findings of the uh, the report of the Global State of uh, Democracy report, and uh, we will also hear uh, from my other colleague Gentiana on specific findings focused on, on the Western Balkans. Uh, but before I uh, move forward and kick it off with the speakers and opening remarks, I have uh, two practical announcements to make. Uh, the first one is that this event will be recorded and then posted uh, online. Uh, and secondly, I would strongly encourage all of you to uh, write your questions throughout the session as they come to your mind. Do not wait for the Q&A session because we will be collecting them throughout the session and then I will uh, have the pleasure to ask them to, to our speakers. Uh, thank you again. And, uh, and now I'd like to give the floor for opening remarks to Mr. Sam van der Stack, uh, our director at the Regional Europe Programme at International IDEA. Over to you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blerta. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this online event on the state of democracy in the Western Bal Balkans. Thank you to all speakers and participants from across the region, a great group of people we have with us today. Uh, special thanks to Giulio Venneri of the European Commission and, of course, thanks to my own colleagues who have helped organize this. Uh, now, I think this is a very timely discussion uh, because at International IDEA, where we monitor democracy around the world, we feel that now is the moment to talk about the state of democracy and how to defend it. Uh, because of all kinds of reasons, but one important one, of course, is Russia's war on Ukraine, which is raging on European territory. Uh, and this has put pressure on democracies all over Europe, but including the Western Balkans. The Western Balkans are not alone in this. As our Global State of Democracy report of last year shows, the quality of democracy is declining all over the world, including in Europe. And what we're seeing is that democracy is therefore subverted from the outside, but also from within. Right? We see the undermining of elections. We see pervasive corruption, autocratic tendencies emerging. So we need to talk about democracy and no country is immune to these developments. We have to maintain democracy even where gains have been made uh, and have to exercise permanent scrutiny of where our democracy stands. So that means we should discuss this, the state of democracy in the Western Balkans and that's what we're aiming to do here today so that we can strengthen it, preserve the gains and fend off all the threats that may come from either inside or outside. Now, doing this against the backdrop of the EU developments that we saw recently, I think is an important connection. Because we have seen that the EU recently stepped up its positive signals. Of course, there's uh, accession talks that have opened with Albania and North Macedonia. Candidate status was granted to Bosnia and a timeline for Kosovo's visa liberalization was announced uh, just recently. So we are standing at an important moment in time but we have to translate all those developments, that integration discussion into democratic gains. And in uh, her State of the Union address in last September, Commission President von der Leyen said that we live in a watershed moment where we need to strengthen democracies on our continent, including in the Western Balkans. But she then said, 
countries must deliver on key democratic consolidation reforms in order to fulfill their membership aspirations. So she clearly linked accession to democratic consolidation. So that's what we hope to discuss today and to help doing over the next uh, months and years. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have some of the most authoritative voices from the field who work on the topic of democracy every day of the week, as well as those within the EU that work on these topics. Now, they will reflect on the findings of IDEA's Global State of Democracy report and the way forward for the Western Balkans so that we can protect and invigorate democracy across the region. I wish you good luck and thank you very much again for being here. Thank you very much, Sam. And uh, without further ado, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Giulio Veneri, team leader at the Rule of Law and Democracy team at the Directorate General for European Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations. Uh, I should also uh, announce that Dr. Veneri uh, will have to excuse himself before the end of, uh, of uh, our event due to impending flight, but we are uh, nevertheless grateful that he could join us, uh, at least for this part of the event, to uh, give us the view of the importance that the EU European Union places uh, to on democracy in the enlargement process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Blerta, and uh, thank you, Sam. Um, I will be able to, to listen uh, and also with great interest to the presentation that Alberto and Gentiana will deliver in a moment, uh, and then, unfortunately, I will have to, uh, I will have to uh, fly out, so uh, you will excuse me, as you mentioned, but um, uh, I look forward to receiving uh, uh, a good debriefing uh, at our next possible location. Um, I think Sam has set the, the tone uh, uh, very well, so um, uh, as usual, making uh, very easy my uh, my contribution and our uh, and our work. Um, uh, and first of all, before we start, let me uh, take the opportunity to commend the recent organization uh, with the Swedish presidency by international idea of the uh, very. Uh, thorough, uh, well-organized event on the presentation of the recommendation on EU external democracy action, where we also contributed. I mean, this has been uh, very informative and a lot of food for thought has, uh, has come for that. So, uh, really, once again, guys, uh, allow me to uh, uh, open a little parenthesis and congratulate you for, for that. Now, let's go on the Western Balkans, of course which is the core focus of our engagement today. Uh, Sam said it all, uh, and thank you for quoting the, 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 the prescience so I can take, uh, I can take one quote off from my um, uh, uh, skeleton speech. Uh, indeed, we are, uh, 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 I think we, we, we have triggered uh, a change of strategic perspective, uh, and the president did it very explicitly at the last uh, uh, statement on the um, State of the Union. Um, uh, we need to defend uh, democracy. We need to do it in a consistent, structured, and well-organized way. Uh, it's not only about um, uh, uh, promoting democracy abroad. Democracy is attacked everywhere in Europe. There is a clear, uh, uh, I like to call it, rise of autocracy around the globe. This is a fact. You also uh, stated this in your uh, in your reports. Uh, uh, it is a quantitative fact, and it's also a fact that affects qualitatively our life and work and engagement. So we cannot turn a blind eye to this fact. And it's very good that there has been this uh, political push for a switch on the approach on, on, on democracy. Um, uh, and indeed, a new package is being prepared uh, for the defense of democracy uh, by the Commission. So we, we are at the very preliminary phases, <clears throat> but this is being put in the pipeline following the Soteus uh, address by, uh, by President von der Leyen. Um, now, I just very briefly want to touch on two points. One uh, highlight of our ongoing work with the Balkans, and Sam gave me already a hook by mentioning the opening of accession negotiations with the Albania and North Macedonia. And the second is, uh, little, allow me a little uh, recap of what were our last uh, messages to the partners uh, uh, countries in the region pertaining to uh, rural law and democracy, because I think uh, uh, we have uh, uh, passed very clear messages, including uh, for the first time 
the way uh, the message on state capture has been presented and state capture and being stigmatized is, is quite uh, strong uh, in the last enlargement uh, uh, package in the communication accompanying the package. So, first point, uh, our ongoing work. Uh, I think the opening of accession talks and the new enlargement methodology have given us uh, an interesting uh, uh, chance to reinvigorate the work on democracy. Of course, uh, uh, the, the consolidation of stable democratic institution was already there since the uh, political criteria was uh, has been defined. So it, it's decades uh, uh, that uh, that this is a core part, integral part of the political criteria. But to have a structured engagement on the functioning of democratic institution, this is a little bit of a novelty of the new methodology. And we have started to do that in the in the context of the screening with Albania and North Macedonia. But of course, this is something that will affect uh, both potential candidate uh, and candidate countries uh, uh, equally. In the context of the open recently open negotiation, we have focused on on three main pillars of action. Uh, one being, of course, the electoral process. This remain a core uh, endeavor. Uh, so not only the efforts to to guarantee uh, free and fair election. Uh, protect the health role of the media in the election campaign, uh, but also we are looking at, at the issue of money in politics, huh? so the funding of political parties and uh, election uh, campaigns. The second pillar is the um, uh, actual functioning of the parliament, so we look at the parliament uh, from an administrative perspective, there is the link here with public administration reform, and then from a political angle, so we are looking at the capacity to ensure transparency, uh, to ensure the highest standards of integrity, and also to of the overall effectiveness of the work of parliaments, including in the very specific uh, function that obviously the assemblies retain, uh, which is the, the oversight of the work of the uh, of the executive. And the third pillar is civil society, uh, which of course has a lot of cross-cutting issues also with the, the work we do on Chapter 23 under the Shop of Fundamental Rights. Uh, but but this is something that is is essential, uh, is core for the functioning of the, of the of democratic institutions. So we have pushed to have a pillar uh, in uh, in this uh, on uh, the role of civil society. So we look at both the the specific legal framework for uh, NGOs to operate within um, within partner countries, but also for the political context for the enabling environment. So we look also at the environmental elements, which are a bit more uh, important uh, and and political. Uh, now, where do we stand with the Balkans? As I said, our our approach uh, uh, last year has been quite uh, uh, frank to our partners. Uh, first of all, there has been a clear call on uh, the need for more genuine political will for reforms on democracy and the rule of law, uh, which is already very telling because it's it's somehow acknowledging that this will has lacked so far. And actually, we notice tendencies somehow to drift away from the main track of uh, uh, um, good governance, the democracy, and rule of law reforms. So this was a very explicit call. Uh, we have issued a call on state capture, as I, as I mentioned, very uh, clear cut. State capture is to be eradicated. Governments shall do all that it's in, in their uh, power to uh, eliminate elements of state capture. So uh, this terminology was very clear. In acknowledging that we have noted tendencies and uh, of state capture across uh, uh, across the region, uh, we have also issued some warning signs when it comes to freedom of expression, media freedom, and pluralism. Uh, despite some limited progress being noted, uh, uh, these are areas where there, there is stagnation, and in some cases even a backsliding. Uh, and this is very, uh, very uh, uh, important for the for a healthy uh, democracy. Uh, I will close it with a message on, on anti-corruption. Uh, on anti-corruption, I think we have a lot of work to do. And, and anti-corruption, uh, successful anti-corruption is uh, key uh, for successful consolidation of democracy. Corruption is a threat to democracy. Corruption empowers uh, the capturing of the state. Corruption empowers the distortion from the rule of the law to the to the rule of the money. So this is what we have to, to fight uh, at the most. And uh, in this context, we have pushed uh, all, all partners in the region uh, to guarantee a meaningful mainstreaming of anti-corruption, which means uh, develop a more strategic approach to anti-corruption in all sectors, in particular those that are the most vulnerable uh, to, to corruption, which require uh, uh, more attention and uh, targeted measures. So, uh, 
Uh, now we are preparing the new the new assessment, the new report, which will be issued in the fall, and this is where we start from. So a lot of work, a lot of challenges, but uh, we look forward to keep the debate uh, 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 ongoing, also with partners like you, which allow us to calibrate uh, our vision and effort in the best possible way. Thank you very much for the opportunity again, and uh, the floor goes back to you, Blerta. Thank you very much, Giulio. Thank you, Sam, and thanks, Giulio. I'll make sure to to convey your congratulations to to the broader team of colleagues who organized last last week event. But really, um, thank you. It's a pleasure uh, to cooperate, and uh, I think uh, with what you've said, both of you, you have uh, already set the ground. You have mentioned briefly uh, all items in which uh, which represent the directions in which we were hoping to to take this conversation and. And so um, I will now move on to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Alberto Fernandez Hipaya, uh, Senior Program Officer at International IDEA, to zoom in uh, into some of the main findings of the Global State of Democracy Report uh, 2022. Over to you, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you, Blerta. Um, uh, thank you, Sam and uh, Julia, for um, setting the stage for what I'm going to present now. Um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I hope technology is working. Uh, I want to present briefly our uh, G uh, Global State of Democracy Report 2022 um, with the title for social contracts in a time of discontent, uh, focusing both on global findings and then zooming in a little bit more on Europe findings. And then my colleague Genta will um, zoom even further into uh, Western Balkan um, findings. Just as an introduction, um, we're not going to discuss here what democracy is, but I want you to understand how international idea measures and understands democracy. So we consider democracy um, to be defined at a minimum as popular control over public decision making and equality between citizens in exercising that control. That's a very minimalistic definition, but we unpack that definition into five attributes representative government, fundamental rights, checks on government, impartial administration, and participatory engagement. That gives us um, five, let's say, pillars of democracy that then we can unpack in um, more concrete um, elements that make up these, these elements. Um, and with that, what we get is not a number. What we get is a complex picture of democracy. So usually um, that might look like this one. So you don't get one number, you get a complex uh, vision where you can understand where the weaknesses and the strengths and things that are improving and not improving in a, in a, in a given democracy are. With that understanding, um, we analyze every year the data that we have. And uh, last year we came, um, uh, the analysis of the data brought us four main conclusions at the global level. The first one is that democracy is in retreat around the world. Countries that are moving towards authoritarianism, meaning they're either uh, becoming hybrid regimes or becoming authoritarian regimes, keep being more um, common than countries that are actually moving to democracy. Uh, that wasn't the case in the 90s. There was more countries becoming democracies, so more autocracies trans transitioning towards um, hybridity and further towards democracy. That's not the case anymore. Uh, the world keeps adding new um, hybrid and uh, authoritarian regimes. But not only that, it is also the case that the quality of the existing democracies is in decline. Even the countries that do not abandon the, the club of democracies, they have um, worse quality of democracy. We measure that by erosion. It's, it's, it's a statistical way of measuring things, but what we detect is that at least one factor, one of the elements that make up a, a democracy, it's suffering, it's suffering a, a considerable, a notable decrease. Some countries have one or two, the majority of these 52 democracies have one or two elements that are uh, not improving, or that are actually declining, but some other countries have <clears throat> a large number of uh, elements that are actually in decline. Some of them are what we define as backsliding. They, they have serious 
uh, issues of erosion that come actually uh, that are driven usually by the central government. That the other side of the coin of this issue is that democratic growth has a stall. In in 2011, um, around 60% of the countries in the world were democracies. That name that number remains basically the same. It means we are not adding more democracies. Democracy is not become not becoming more uh, used as a political system. If we zoom in a little bit more into each of the attributes, we also see that. Uh, the average world improvement of attributes that we can trace back to the 80s all the way to around the year 2010 has stalled. Um, on average, the world is not becoming better at the key aspects of democracy. It's not having better, like more representative governments. It's not having better impartial administrations. The world democracy quality and democracy growth has stalled. That probably is partly a consequence, partly um, the reason why um, there is an increasing uh, there is an increasing um, attractiveness for people of um, auto autocratic leadership. So we have seen the World Value Service shows how um, there is an increased number of people that have a fairly good or very good opinion of autocratic leadership. So not only democracies are losing quality, it's also they're losing Democrats, which is probably even uh, more worrisome. There are some signs of hope. Um, I, I want just to know three here, uh, very briefly, the Gambia, the Dominican Republic and Moldova, three completely different countries in three completely different economic situations, but there are signs of hope. Uh, the Gambia has been on a transition in the last years. The Dominican Republic, although it has remained a democracy for many years, it has constantly improved all the aspects of democracy. Moldova has done a um, uh, remarkable uh, trip towards uh, uh, improving the quality of, of democracy in the country. So there are signs of hope and there are signs of um, ways that countries can improve their democracies. This is the general global picture. Let me zoom in a little bit more on the European picture. And it, it shares a lot of the characteristics. Um, democracy remains the main form of the, the main form of government in Europe. Um, only 89% uh, of the countries in Europe are democracies, and that's um, that's impressive. And not all their uh, region is uh, democratic, but performance is stagnant. Uh, there is no um, there is no more high performing democracies. We see slight growth of authoritarian regimes. This is the case of Russia having become an authoritarian regime in the last um, iteration of the data. Um, so what we see is that even if democracy remains the main form of government, it's stagnant. 43% um, of democracies in Europe have suffered erosion. So there are also uh, signs like more than half of democracies are actually losing quality. And two countries, Poland and Hungary, are backsliding. What does it mean? It means that today almost half of the Europeans live in an eroding democracy. So if we take all the population of Europe, 49% of people live in a, um, a road in democracy, a democracy, let's put it this way, that used to be better. A further 30% live in non-democracies. So they don't, they don't even live in a, in a democracy. And the lucky 21% that lives in a democracy that is not eroding. So it's just 21% of Europeans live in a democracy that is not eroding, that it's at least remained as good as it used to be a few years ago. Um, one of them, uh, if we want to highlight one aspect that is um, all over Europe suffering a lot of um, declines is media integrity. And um, as you can see in this graph, the number of countries that are declining in media integrity keeps racing around 2000, from 2005, 2010, which is when social media started to um, to become really uh, relevant in our communications. Um, we, we could delve um, forever on, on this topic, but it's just an example of how declines affect countries all over uh, Europe. 
non-democratic regimes are becoming more consolidated. This is um, uh, a picture of how Belarus has become less democratic of, I mean, it was already an authoritarian regime, but it, it, it's qual the quality or how far, how close or far from democracy it was has worsened um, in recent years. It's consolidating the authoritarianism in the country. Um, one of the consequences of democratic of, of stagnation and of the loss of quality and, and the holy crisis in which we live today, the cost of living crisis, um, is, for instance, voter turnout. We see that most countries have negative voter turnout. People turn out to vote less and less um, every year. Just a handful of countries have actually increased um, voter turnout. And this calls for, um, this is what the report says, calls for a new social contract. We need to redefine the social contract that democracy offers. Um, just as an example um, of things that we can consider is, for instance, um, the importance um, of, of democratic values and institutions uh, seen as a barrier to Russian irredentism and neocolonialism, uh, for instance, in Armenia, in the Republic of Moldova, or in Ukraine before the Russian invasion. Um, and as I already say, this is the case of Moldova that has seen uh, a significant improvement in part as an answer to this irredentism. Um, and let me just take two minutes to present the Global State of Democracy Initiative, just so you understand where all our data and information comes. Um, we have four components. The, the data that we use comes from a democracy tracker that I will introduce now, and the GSOD indices, which is our measure, uh, our compilation of measures of all the uh, elements of, of, that I presented before of a democracy. Um, the tracker is a tool that tries to uh, that is going is, is tracking um, events that affect the quality of democracy in 173 countries so all over the world. Um, it's it's event that we consider can affect the potential potentially the quality of democracy is classified uh, within our framework, and then those with more impact are tagged either as negative or positive. So these events, uh, this is just an example from Vietnam, we get the date, we get uh, a summary, we get as many sources as needed. So this is as impartial as possible. This is not us um, making up the event. We use the most reputable sources. This is a very intensive work of um, finding sources. Um, we also, uh, classify this, uh, what, what, what uh, aspects of democracy are fundamental. Um, and then we generate these um, country profiles in which you can, um, you can see a little bit of a description of the country. You can see um, the performance of the country in the last, um, in, in the indices, basic information about the country, the electoral system, uh, the system of government, the name of the head of state, um, which human rights treaties have been signed by the country. Um, and then also, um, a summary, the monthly updates, the last updates um, from from the country, what has happened that is relevant for democracy in the last months, and that is also compiled in this um, this box. And below, you can check um, the performance of the country more in general when it comes to to democracy. Um, save okay, and. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you again for joining us and give you, Berta, um, the floor back. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you very much indeed for this uh, not always very encouraging yet important global and European findings, which are certainly useful to be able to contextualize and understand better uh, what we're going to look into now. That is the specific uh, findings for the Western Balkans. So over to you, Genta. It's my colleague, Gentiana Gola, program officer within the democracy assessment team that will uh, guide us through some of the main findings for the region. Thank you. Over. Um, thank you, Glierta. Thank you, colleagues, for the remarks and the, for the presentation, Alberto. Um, so, uh, today, I will try to share with you the main findings of the Global State of Democracy Indices 
on Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and Serbia. Countries, as you know, often referred to as the Western Balkan Six. So the GSOD indices define three broad regime types. Um, democracies consisting of low, mid, and high-performing democracies, as well as hybrid regimes and authoritarian regimes. When it comes to the Western Balkan Six, um, there are no high-performing democracies or authoritarian regimes, as you can see in the graph here. Uh, however, Kosovo, Montenegro, and North Macedonia are mid-performing democracies, while Albania and Bosnia and Herzegovina are weak democracies. Serbia, the region's biggest country, is a hybrid regime, so the only non-democratic country uh, in the Western Balkans. Serbia has been backsliding since 2013, became a hybrid regime in 2020, as government control of the media space as well as restrictions on campaigning were consolidated. The country was among the hybrid regimes with the greatest number of sub-attributes registering five-year democratic declines in 2021, including free political parties, clean elections, civil liberties, and effective parliament. Serbia is one of the five uh, non-democracies in Europe, in addition to Russia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Belarus. However, uh, the majority of people in the Western Balkans, around 61%, live in a democracy. Montenegro and Kosovo have seen recent overall democratic progress marked by successful elections and an increase in impartial administration. Um, the Western Balkan countries continue to perform under the average of the wider Central Europe. And impartial administration, an attribute which consists of two sub-attributes, absence of corruption and predictable enforcement sub-attributes, is the only attribute with low performance uh, in the Western Balkans. And low performers are Serbia, Albania, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. In representative government, which is an attribute that includes four sub-attributes, clean elections, inclusive suffrage, free political parties, and ele uh, electoral uh, elected government. And out of all these areas, clean elections has seen bigger changes in the region. Uh, clean elections represent an area of movement, but in diverging directions. Serbia has seen a significant decline, while Kosovo advanced in this area, drawing closer to the average for the Central European countries. Uh, the fundamental rights attributes uh, consist of the access to justice, civil liberties, and social rights and equality sub-attributes. The average score for fundamental rights in the Western Balkans region is on the whole lower than it has been five and even ten years ago. Um, however, the decline has not been significant, so we can say uh, that fundamental rights have been stagnating at the country level, and no countries in the Western Balkans have registered significant changes. It's important to note that Albania has the highest score in the region, performing consistent with Central European averages, although it remains mid-range and has shown evidence of stagnation for the past two decades. Basic welfare is a subcomponent stemming from the fundamental rights attribute that has particularly experienced changes in the region. Compared to 20 years ago, basic welfare has consistently improved in Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia, and Serbia. In 2021, the average score for Western Balkans countries in basic welfare uh, was high performing. Serbia, North Macedonia, Montenegro, and Bosnia and Herzegovina are high performers, with Montenegro performing above the average for Central Europe as well as the average for Europe as a whole. Checks on government uh, consist of the effective uh, parliament, judicial independence, and media integrity sub-attributes. Serbia has declined significantly here, uh, moving from the strongest in the region to the weakest in the span of 10 years. Otherwise, as you can see here, there has been a great deal of stagnation. Uh, media integrity is a checks on government sub-attribute, as I mentioned earlier. The only significant changes to the media integrity in the region have been declines. Bosnia and Herzegovina saw a decline in its score compared to five years ago, and Serbia saw declines compared to 10 years ago. North Macedonia, and in the short term, Kosovo, have shown a positive trajectory. And impartial administration, um, as I mentioned earlier, consists of absence of corruption and predictable enforcement sub-attributes. 
And impartial administration is one of the most critical areas for the region, as most of you know. We can observe greater variance in impartial administration scores in 2021 compared to five and 10 years ago, suggesting that countries are moving further apart in this area. While Kosovo and North Macedonia, uh, as we can see here, are uh, breaking away to be comfortably mid-range, Serbia has moved into the low-performing category and Bosnia and Herzegovina continues on a downward, downward trajectory. Um, however, this trend has been happening gradually uh, and the lack of significant changes signals stagnation, which is concerning uh, as impartial administration is the only attribute with low performers. Um, although it is still mid-performing, Kosovo registered a significant increase compared to 2016 and 2011, becoming the strongest in the region in this attribute. In 2021, Kosovo performed above the average for Central Europe. These have been the biggest and most important changes related to Western Balkans' uh, state of democracy, which I hope we can discuss into more detail um, with our distinguished panelists and the audience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gentiana. Again, thank you, Alberto. A lot of food for thought. So uh, I think we are uh, ready to to move uh, into the core of uh, of this uh, event today. The the panel discussion uh, with the distinguished guests that I have the pleasure to to announce. Uh, we have the company of Miss Alexandra Tomanich, Executive Director for the European Fund for the Balkans. Mr. Demus Shasha, Executive Director of the European Policy. Institute of Kosovo, uh, Mr. Giorgi Vurmo, Program Director at the Institute for Democracy and Mediation in Tirana, Albania, as well as Dr. Simonita Kacharska, Director of the European Policy Institute in North Macedonia. Um, I, as I said, uh, a lot of data, a lot of food for thought, and we welcome uh, very much uh, your, your your comments. Perhaps I can start uh, uh, with the first question regarding the fact, as we heard, um, still in good news, most of the citizens of the EU, uh, of the Western Balkans, still live in a democracy. That's certainly a good news. However, as Ginta mentioned, we notice significant stagnation in key areas of uh, democracy, such such as fundamental rights and checks on government. So my question to you uh, would be, how do the GSOD findings resonate with what you observe uh, in the field across the region in your daily work? And which issues do you assess as most urgent to be addressed? Perhaps I can uh, pose the question first to Ms. Tomanic. Thank you. Well, hello from Belgrade. Hello from the capital of the one of the five non-democracies in Europe. So we have seen um, the graph. So I think it's really, although we, we live there since many years, it's really shocking to see the steep, the steep decline. Um, we definitely do witness everything what uh, the, the report is showing, but we do witness it since, since many years. And um, we also do speak about it for many years. And there I want to make the bridge to something that has been mentioned earlier. Sam mentioned in his introductions the link that Commission President von der Leyen made with accession and democracy. Well, I would like to remember all of us that uh, Ms. von der Leyen was uh, in the Balkans last year and the year before, and that her statements were shocking, and that's diplomatic wording when I say shocking. Uh, she was here in Serbia where she was praising publicly the tremendous reform efforts and fundamentals and so on. So basically either being terribly briefed or having an, another agenda, but these kind of statements by high level EU officials coming to the region make it very difficult for civil society to follow up, to work or to be critical because when we are critical, uh, decision makers point to Ms. von der Leyen or to the former German chancellor. And if they are happy, who are we to not be happy? And I see Mr. Veneri left, um, but he said something and I wrote that down that uh, the EU will ask that governments should do everything to eradicate state capture. And I'm a bit confused after this statement, and it's a pity that he left because it's actually the governments that have captured the state. So I'm not sure 
how they will uncapture them only because the EU is asking them to do this favor. And the state capture was mentioned already uh, in 2018 in the Commission papers for the first time. And for five long years, absolutely nothing has happened as a follow up. Quite the contrary, uh, on the ground, we see that state capture has increased, that democracy decline has increased. So nobody can say uh, they didn't know or were not aware. Um, we um, in, in, in Serbia definitely face, as I said, but we see it throughout the region, voter turnout was mentioned. We see more and more people completely disengaging from the water process. We are already happy when it's about 50%. Uh, so this is a big problem. And I think this is also a big question for us from civil society. How can we reach out to citizens? How can we leave our bubble we are in and where we talk to the, where we preach to the converted? We are the ones who have to make the, the reach out to citizens because nobody else will. Obviously, governments that have captured the states have no interest in actually creating citizens. They definitely prefer to speak about people. They are the big daddy who is taking care of all of us minors who don't know and shouldn't know better. We also see that in some of the regional um, and for the region crucial uh, processes, like, for example, the open Balkans, which remains a mystery box where you don't know what's actually happening or in the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, where we try to make a puzzle and a mosaic out of different media leakages. So um, it's absolutely no transparency uh, from that side. So I think that there is a lot of room to, to change our approach and um, to not end on a too pessimistic part. We have across the region really a lot of citizens uprisings and various local initiatives and movements. And I think that there is the energy we are all looking for and that these people need to be supported with knowledge, with expertise, with advice, uh, and of course also with funds. Um, because this is something that uh, is already boiling and is there and definitely should be used. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, I can ask uh, Dr. Kacharska to, if she would have any comment on the most pressing issues for the region. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon from Skopje uh, as well. Uh, I think we, if we want to, Alexandra ended with the good news. I think uh, the starting point of the good news is that actually, uh, according to your approach, uh, the region, most of us actually live in a democracy, which is not something Why that we... <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, which is not something that you're usually told. I mean, it's it kind of also stands out in comparison to other inter indices. I mean, just last week, I think we had the Economist Intelligence Unit coming out, and yeah, we are either weak, fallible, and so on, or we are usually bottled up in the hybrid um, in the hybrid uh, definition. So I think that's probably something that kind of stood with me uh, as a, as the good point, but. Um, on a more serious, uh, on a more serious note, um, I think uh, one of the key things that do st did stand out with me is your assessment on the fundamental rights aspect, because this is the one that uh, was mentioned by uh, Gentiana as uh, the uh, one of the most uh, one of the weakest points in the region. And thank you for the presentation very much. It was very uh, very valuable. Um, I wanted to start with that one because I think. Um, this is uh, an aspect that has been neglected more uh, systematically over time now. I see that Albania was uh, the best performer on this, if I remember if I remember well, which is something that maybe Gergi can comment on. But I see this uh, as a result, uh, um, this really resonates with what we do. It resonates with uh, the weakening of the uh, democracy uh, consensus overall on an international level. Um, it resonates also, um, I think for us, it uh, reflects also the very much the um, focus on uh, the EU accession process, which in itself 
uh, in my view and from our research actually does not deal properly with fundamental with fundamental rights because the EU relies mostly on international instruments beyond the charter itself. And we are experiencing for the last decade, if not more, the weakening of all of these international covenants on many of the on human on human rights topics, which is actually which uh, including such as the UN, the Council of Europe for us, and so on, which are actually the the homes for protecting fundamental rights. I mean, you don't hear that much about uh, about these instruments in in the region. Uh, due to this focus on, especially on the union, who's the, and we, the union itself does not have a strong side, uh, a strong element of uh, of this component, which is something that we can come back to uh, later about whether there are venues for improvement. But I think that this is one of the core aspects for me, which also reflects the um, overall gaps in the functioning of the system, because fundamental rights at the end of the day depend on a functioning judiciary, on impartial administration, they depend on all of these pillars, which are uh, weak, uh, which have been assessed as weak, despite the fact that we have been uh, uh, categorized as democracies. Um, the other big uh, aspect that maybe uh, the colleagues that uh, I've not, I did not uh, manage to see the post 2020 assessment when we talk about the fundamental rights, because there, we've all been experiencing on a global level, a big retrenchment in this respect in the post COVID circumstances with a focus on violations on of fundamental rights of vulnerable groups. And this is something that is likely to be even exacerbated in societies such as ours, which are very much unequal and tend to provide very weak, uh, weak uh, protection. Um, uh, now the the la last, uh, I think that there is a light possibly at the end of the tunnel because fundamental, actually on fundamental rights, there are a lot of instruments and here the capacity of civil society is actually very strong. But we need to draw upon that uh, that uh, capacity, and I don't think we are uh, we are still uh, there. I think I'll end at this point for this first round, and thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kacharska, for drawing these important links uh, that all lead eventually to fundamental rights. Uh, I should add, we at uh, International IDEA have closely monitored the respect of uh, human rights during the COVID pandemic, for which we have a whole set of uh, separate detailed tracking, and uh, uh, indeed it resonates with uh, much of what you said as regards the, the restrictions and the, and the impact that the pandemic have had with with the risk of uh, persistence in in the region beyond the pandemic but thank you very much um i'd like maybe to give the floor uh to, to Gergi since he was mentioned uh, during dr kacharska's uh, presentation Gergi, if you have any comment to add on the pressing issues for the region or albania Thank you, and let, let me start with uh, congratulations to to Idea for um, for the report. Um, I in the past few days I, I've read very carefully the the reports that you shared with us, and a couple of questions have been in my mind constantly. Um, some of the things that are bothering me, and I believe many others in the Western Balkans, my my colleagues Alexandra and, and Simonida. Uh, touched upon really, um, um, but then I was also triggered by uh, the European Commission representative um, uh, take uh, at the beginning, and and it's really a pity that um, he's not present to follow on the the debate. Um, look, uh, we all know lack of democracy kills. Uh, and we see that uh, with with Russia today in Ukraine, we see that in in many in many countries. Um, but here's the thing: um, also flawed democracies or semi-consolidated democracies kill. Uh, the difference is that uh, the semi-consolidated democracies kill um, over longer period of time, but they also do. They don't do it through guns like Putin, but they do it via pollution. They do it via a uh, breach of food safety standards. 
they do it uh, via uh, lack of construction or, or um, construction building safety standards. Um, so to me, that's um, equally concerning. So um, maybe in some countries in the region, um, as you said, people live in um, democracy and, and not in a regime. Uh, but um, the question is, what kind of democracy? It's not a fully fledged democracy, certainly. It's um, it's not a sustainable pace of um, democratization. And uh, one of the most striking findings, uh, again, not that we didn't know, uh, but still it's worth repeating, is uh, not only the fact that generally uh, the, demo the democracies are in decline, uh, but so is the number of Democrats, um, as, as you said at the beginning. So the number of people who believe in democracy, the number of people who put their hopes in democracy, in democratic institutions, in democratic processes. And I think that's that's the most um, uh, concerning finding that that um, that that I take um, from this from this study. Um, some of the issues that need urgent uh, urgently to be addressed for the region, uh, we all know it's corruption, it's state capture, is media capture, is shrinking civic space, is the lack of hope among people and youngsters leaving the region, um, lack of public trust in institutions, in processes. Um, this as regards internal factors. External factors are also important. So um, some of the issues that I think it's important uh, relate to, to the EU, because the EU is the main, uh, let's say, strategic objective of many countries in the region. I'm not saying of all the countries in the region, because we know the, 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 the data, the polls, but still, uh, even uh, formally, um, we can say that um, it, it's a strategic objective from, from all sides. So in this sense, um, we need um, a, a, an urgent issue, I would say, is um, also more clarity about uh, the EU enlargement or EU integration or EU accession, call it whatever. Uh, because we've seen many, um, many versions of uh, what uh, we should hope from, from the EU. Um, and one very small um, comment on, on the uh, EC enlargement methodology. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, revising it, reviving it, restructuring it, I don't know what. Um, to me, the core question is not how we monitor the countries, uh, but what the EU does with the findings of the monitoring of the countries. So precisely what Alexandra said at the, at the beginning, um, it's not that the 2016 version of uh, the, the monitoring methodology of the European Union, of the European Commission, uh, couldn't find the traces of state capture. Uh, the difference is what, uh, what did they do with those findings and with those um, traces? And we certainly didn't appreciate much uh, any EU officials coming to, to our countries, uh, ignoring certain very strong um, pledges for, for democracy from people outside the state and the government. Uh, and instead of that, uh, praising governments for some kind of um, progress, uh, you know, just a form to encourage them to keep up with good work. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I I can't I I can't accept that. I mean, it's been really too long uh, that we see those kind of visits, and uh, we really had enough. Um, okay, I think I'll stop here. Um, one last point: security loopholes in the region. These are also important. Uh, that uh, issues that take much more importance given the context um, with with uh, Russian aggression and and, and uh, other other actors. So uh, Kosovo recognition, um, Bosnia, uh, constant institutional crisis, uh, the case of North Macedonia being blocked uh, for, you know, uh, 
um, not so principled reasons. Um, these are all issues that um, don't affect simply a process, but will affect democracy in this country, in these uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Georgi. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Shasha will emphasize, or I have a chance to mention it. I believe, uh, well, the new revised methodology of the EU certainly is, is still being implemented. And so we'll see, hopefully it will add to the EU's leverage, but I believe one of the novelties is uh, that uh, the reversibility of the process, which uh, should in principle at least uh, uh, serve as a as a you know additional leverage for or a warning for for the countries that do not stick to to the democratic reform process. But again, it's it's early. Um, uh, perhaps, Mr. Mr. Shasha, did you have a, a comment on how the findings of the report resonate and the pressing issues in the region? I can you hear me? I think so. Yes. Just yes. Check, so yes right. We can. It's a pleasure to join you today and thank you for your kind uh, invitation and I join congratulations on your latest your latest report, uh, which is a very fitting, a very good addition to a number of uh, credible international reports in the Western Balkans and in particular, and in particular I liked your very clear and crisp uh, infographics uh, that beautifully summarized your findings since in particular in our line of work, uh, we often fall into this trap of, of overly complicating uh, our technical reports and research. So chapeau on all the work done uh, uh, on, the, on, your latest, on your latest report. So I'll try to keep my interventions uh, short since our panel, as you have seen, is packed with uh, immense experience and expertise. And I look forward to hearing uh, not only colleagues' uh, insights, but also participants' uh, participant thoughts and, and, and questions. I would like to organize my remarks along two themes, if you will. So first, I'd, I'd like to make a few more general points with regard to state of democracy around the world, uh, and then zoom in into our region and see what are key developments that we have been witnessing in the recent years and that yet you have also captured and presented in your so my first point is more general. I would argue that since the last major global political development, respectively fall of communism and fall of Iron Curtain and, and disintegration of Soviet Union at the end of 80s, beginning of 90s, um, democracy was understood and perceived as an inevitable destiny of our civilization. We kind of thought that this is the end of history, uh, to use a popular book book title. Now, what what that kind of thinking did is that set it set our societies on autopilot, as everything is predetermined, and democracy surely, uh, progress, human rights, capitalism, all these things will surely be the only possible outcome, we as humans have lowered our guards. Uh, and in the meantime, malign dark forces were recognizing and exploiting democracy's deficiencies. And they were setting ground for war against democracy. Now, all of this happened to borrow from Hemingway gradually and then suddenly. Uh, so from Hungary to China and from Russia to US, axes, axes of illiberal forces were sharpening and updating their toolkit for the assault on democracy all over the world. Now, slowly but surely, the time came uh, to attack the Capitol Hill to try to bring an illiberal politician at the head of the country that at its foundation has the motto of liberty. 
And now, most lately, wage war against a democratic, peace-loving country on European soil. Now, luckily, all these attacks have failed, at least for now. Therefore, their failures should not be confused with democratic victory. They have lost a battle, not a war. In countries across, across the world, uh, from US to Europe, from China to Brazil, illiberal politicians command vast masses, vast masses of, of people. And they are working hand in hand to expand their illiberal way of life throughout the world. And today's, as we are all seeing, main battleground for the survival of democracy is, is in Ukraine. So my first point is that historically speaking, we have to draw a lesson, a lesson learned from the fact that we as humans have taken democracy for granted. Illiberals haven't. They worked hard to undermine and defeat democracy. Therefore, as, as it was noted at the beginning, we need to do something about it. We need to respond. Um, or in the words of, of historian Timothy Snyder, we have to, we have to treat democracy as a, as a verb, not as a noun. So democracy is not something that is out there and will survive on its own. It will prosper on its own. Uh, it requires for each one of us to do something about it. Just like people of Ukraine are doing something about it, and just like people of Iran are doing something about it. Now I'll, I'll move to my to my second point and move closer to to our region. So overall, our region has not been immune of these global trends and battle between autocracy and democracy. Picture is one of of mixed result. On one hand. We have seen good progress being made in Kosovo and in North Macedonia. While developments in Serbia, Bosnia, and Montenegro have been concerning, the situation remains more complicated in Albania. And overall, leaders in the region have recognized in the past few years, they have recognized rightly the lack of international political interest and attention for the region. And under such blanket of ignorance, they have consolidated their power and installed many of the autocratic traits uh, uh, that we see across the world. So just, just to take uh, uh, an example, in two largest countries of the region, so in Serbia and in Albania, leaders of the respective countries have refused, have refused to let go of power through free and fair elections. And they are now in power for more than 10 years. Now, to bring that into perspective, imagine if today President of the United States is still George W. Bush, or President of France is still Nicolas Sarkozy or Prime Minister of Italy is still uh, Enrico Letta. Huh? So my point is that this is unimaginable in proper functioning democracies. So in this light, in recent years, uh, we have seen uh, uh, in, in the region implementation of clear and persistent autocratic blueprints for the abolishment of all checks and balances on power. This has, this has been done not in a single dramatic act, like a coup or, or something like that, but through a series of small little steps that ensured formalistic respect of the letter of the law, but utterly, utterly undermined the spirit and the intent of the law. Therefore, today, we in the Western Balkans are in this situation where there is virtually no checks and balances on executive power. There is virtually no investigative journalism and no meaningful opposition in almost all countries of the, of the region. And all of this, all of this 
was done under the banner, under the banner of stability and under the banner of EU integration. Now to come to come to your specific question uh, and share my view how G G GSOD findings uh, resonate with daily reality on the ground in the Western Balkans. Well, you mentioned you mentioned significant stagnation on key democracy attributes such as fundamental rights and checks on governments. Well, this resonates very very loudly. Uh, let me take quickly a few examples. Um, today, in two biggest countries of the region, so in Serbia and in Albania, uh, biggest public investment projects are not being implemented by Western, American, European companies, but by the one and same Middle Eastern company through highly, highly dubious public procedures. Now, of course, the governments will respond that all proper procedures were followed. But this is exactly exemplary of the environment where indeed government might have respected the letter of the law, but they have utterly undermined the spirit of the law. And since all checks on government powers in Albania and in Serbia have been dismantled or put under the control of the ruling parties, there is no room for political opposition to undertake any meaningful political and institutional action to challenge and stop plans of respective governments. Nor there is virtually any investigative journalism to expose fraudulent public narratives promoted by respective governments. Since almost all of the media landscape in these two countries are under the control of the ruling parties, you also mentioned, you also mentioned uh, fundamental rights. In Serbia today, let alone, let alone that individual citizens' fundamental rights are being violated, but fundamental rights of their political representatives are being violated. So today in Serbia, political opposition and their children, even their children, are openly and publicly harassed by security apparatus, as we have witnessed in the case of Mr. Zdravko Ponoš and Ms. Rada Trajković. And again, by strictly following the letter of the law, but utterly undermining, undermining its spirit. So, so I will stop here. These are just some initial uh, uh, reflections uh, to offer general impressions about the state of, of democracy in the in the region, and I look forward to listening to to my colleagues and follow up uh, during the time that 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 we have. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Shasha. Um, uh, before I move uh, to um, uh, before I move to the next question, I do just like to remind uh, our uh, kind audience uh, to to list their questions in in writing because we will soon be getting to a Q and A session. Um, and now to moving to a. The next question. Well, it, it I think it's clear. It resonates amongst all all of you a certain uh, pessimism uh, on the fact that uh, there is a accepted there's a clear slowdown when it comes to democratic uh, consolidation and, and in some cases even a democratic backsliding um, in trend in in the region. So I guess my next question would be what would need to change in the political or institutional setup to potentially spur uh, to, to reverse this trend, to spur a new wave of democratization, if I can put it in these words. And, and are there any positive examples at all in the region um, of any topic, field or country? Thank you. I can maybe invite, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll start from, I'll start again from Mr. Manich, just to keep the, the order. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, yeah, I mentioned already in my first intervention that they are positive examples and they can be found across the region and that are really these local movements and civic initiatives. And um, they're really a regional phenomenon and they don't only bear the potential for democratization because people get together, start reading laws, start interacting with the local authorities, uh, consult a lawyer. I mean, that's uh, 
basic civic education that provides uh, better effects than any workshop could do. Because even if they fail to protect their park or their river or whatever, they have learned a lot and they become aware and they're, they're there, they're, they're citizens in the core meaning of this uh, word. So I think that there really is a lot of potential. But two things about that. First, I think also it's really important that it's a regional phenomenon because we see in many countries um, that these people fighting for example, environmental things like for the rivers against mini hydropower plants, that they overcome also ethnic divisions. We have seen that in Kosovo and Srpce, where both Kosovo Albanians and Kosovo Serbs have fought for their river. So ethnicity wasn't a problem or a topic any longer, it was their river. And we also see that across Bosnia. And this is really hopeful. Um, environment is the new topic um, because our politicians keep us in nation state building topics of the 19th centuries and citizens themselves are already in the 21st century in really seeing that environmental topics are threatening us all and that uh, our uh, policy maker or political decision makers are absolutely not aware of the, of the threats of the present times and, and as I said, keep us in, in history and myths and nationalism. So from this regional perspectives, we really see that re regarding environment, there is a lot of things happening regarding public spaces, and there we come to corruption. So also you see that in Tirana, in Belgrade, in Skopje, really people uh, getting together, uh, protecting what is left of, of public spaces. Decent work is increasingly becoming a joint issue because we always talk about regional economic integration, but nobody speaks about the social dimension of it and the fact that we are competing into lowering uh, wages and ending up in uh, in work poverty increasingly. Uh, of course, that's, that's depending on sectors, but it's a huge issue. Um, so I definitely think that, that there is potential. Um, I'm just afraid that we are running against time here because um, let me just take Serbia as an example. We have seen many protests in the 90s in Serbia. The beginning of the 90s, there were anti-war protests. And in the mid 90s, there were protests against Milosevic and his strict uh, local elections. And at the end of the 90s, there were the final big wave of protests that finally brought him down. In between, there were massively other protests, minor protests one. So we have seen a whole decade of protests which in substance, if you look also at your data, we see that in 30 years, basically nothing has changed. We are not fighting the same narratives and policies. We are literally fighting the same people by name and surname. And this is very depressing. So I'm really always very even emotionally touched when I see that people still go out to fight because I see among my generation that many say, I've demonstrated a lot. I've passed my whole youth outside. I don't want my kids to, to, to go that way. It's not worth it. They should uh, find their luck outside of, of this country. So I think we are really running um, with this democratization from, from, from the bottom and from, from the citizens themselves. This is a process that would take time. And I'm afraid we don't have this time. If you look at the migration numbers, that's one big issue. I'm really not sure with whom we are going to talk, to work, or even less to talk to um, in five, okay, or let's be optimistic in 10 years. So I really think that we have a big issue there. We are losing um, substantially um, people, not only to migration, there is the latest data from the European Environmental Agency stating that in the Western Balkans, so in the Western Balkans six, we are losing 30,000, 30,000 lives each year, only as a direct result of air pollution. So we have burning issues and we are discussing abstract concepts or, 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 or nation state building concepts while we are all dying with having to breathe this toxic and poisoned air. So these are the topics where, where citizens then come up with themselves um, often they then come in for a non-existing state and have to deal with issues where the state has withdrawn itself or just doesn't feel responsible, although it would be a 
a clearly state uh, state uh, responsibility. So yeah, on the one hand, I see certain um, uprisings that provide hope, but on the other, I think that we cannot do it our own. That for certain issues, you really need the state, which we don't have, and the timing issue. So um, overall, I wouldn't even say I'm, I'm pessimistic. I would say I'm I'm uh, I'm realistic, unfortunately. But reality is not positive. So that's that's where I where I see myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, the issue of climate. Uh change and the need for action was also mentioned by Georgi, but thanks also for you to you for bringing it out very loud because uh, uh, on all reports that the region is uh, is is a threat and uh, we at uh, international idea uh, see the challenge of, of climate as, as a failure of governance and and as a risk to democracy at the same time democracy is the only system that could possibly take action and and get humanity out of uh, of, of this situation but uh, uh, it's also, you know, one, one risks to bring down the other. So, so strengthening democracy needs to go hand in hand also with with climate action. So, and thanks for the heartwarming examples of um, uh, overcoming ethnicity, uh, ethnic division over uh, these global issues. Um, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Kacharska had anything to highlight something positive in the region or, or what could would need to change to spur maybe a new wave of democracy in the region. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Simoni, that is just fine as well. Um, yes, Alexandra covered the, the human uh, dimension. I mean, you posed a big question, a new wave of democratization. I mean, that's, that's, that's big, but uh, uh, if we take a look at the post 90 period that came at a period of a huge change of a transformative change in the, in the world at the world level and the whole of a system. And I don't think we're going to be, um, we're going to be experiencing that uh, that soon here. I completely agree with what Demos said that most of these uh, state captures happened very much by using legitimate means. And this is a very by shaping laws, and this is something that Gergi has also uh, worked on uh, very extensively. And uh, it came as a, I think that uh, in a way our previous government gave a model uh, gave a model for that how to legitimize uh, some of these uh, state captures. So I, I'm not sure that we can expect a big wow uh, event or uh, a big bang that would lead to a new wave of democratization. Um, Alexandra covered the 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 bottom up approach. I would uh, go back to the, I would emphasize the responsibility of the union, to be honest, because of the European Union in this sense. Because I think in this, all of this disappointment realism that Alexandra also mentioned, I think it's also, um, the time is also a result of this, of being in this loophole, in being, being in this alternative scenario of a waiting room for the region to actually accede to, to the union. Uh, which, um, with the promise that uh, and the expectation that it will have an impact, uh, a democratizing impact on on the acceding countries. Now, this whole um, premise has been severely um, undermined, not only by the example of Poland uh, and Hungary and so on. I mean, does accession actually? Uh, uh, mean democratization, but if we look at your indices and many other indices, it's also raising questions about how currently the European accession process affects these affects the countries in the region that are exceeding, having in mind that Serbia would be classified as part of the front runners. So this is a bit of a counterintuitive uh, uh, segment in in terms of the European accession process. I don't need to go even further than that. Uh, but I think um, for a region that uh, is um, encircled in Europe, for uh, having in mind uh, the recent political statements that Europe is at an awakening moment, I think that uh, there needs to be a re-examination there if there is capacity in, in the European Union, in some of its member states, maybe in the upcoming uh, commission to actually think more of their own enlargement policy as a democratizing tool, because we don't, I don't, I think it's probably too late to be discussing this current, this current commission, but uh, let's hope that we will all have enough time to reflect on what went wrong, at least in the 
two last uh, commissions on enlargement policy, let's say in the last 14 years, and to think of what was good so that we can maybe start working together on integrating a region of which is probably now less than 15 million people in total, which is completely economically connected to the European to the European Union. We did not talk a lot about economy here, but uh, if we go back to some of the basic postulates of the democratic consolidation process, the economic empowerment of the population is a very important segment uh, of that uh, of that story. I'm not claiming that uh, economy will trump democracy, but uh, there is a certain level of development which needs to go hand in hand as, as uh, history has shown in order to actually be able to build a sound, uh, sound democracy. And it's likely to be high, a higher level of economic development than what we have currently in, uh, in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, clear, clear call, I believe, for the EU to step in with a stronger role. Um, uh, perhaps, Jerzy, um, anything uh, to highlight on what could spur a new wave of democracy or any positive trends you notice? I think both Alexandra and Simonida covered it very well um, with with uh, both very specific examples as as to uh, what could spur democracy. Really, the the situation in in the region when it comes to rule of law, democracy, good governance, is not at its um, best, um, especially when hopes are are concerned. Uh, so. I don't know. I I would um, we can identify um, examples that that inspire. Um, and if you notice, uh, the key ingredient in those uh, examples are the people, people who are dedicated to democracy. And I think that's the key word that the Commission and the EU stakeholders and other Western stakeholders should take. Uh, don't put all your um, don't bet everything on uh, some politicians on individuals that at a certain moment look reformers and they very soon transform themselves into the new autocrats as we are witnessing currently. So the only people the, the only ingredient that will never let you down are the people. So uh, let's work to expand uh, the number of, of um, citizens of societies that are adhere, that adhere to democratic values and uh, who, who which democratic values are, are very dear and they would stand for uh, for for those values. I think this is the um, and there are many examples. I mean Macedonia in 2016. That's what changed things. Kosovo. Over the past several years, again, is the vibrant society, uh, uh, citizens uh, who care about institutions that made um, such a shift in the political scene that we haven't seen, I mean, all five other Western Balkan countries haven't seen in, in the past 20 years. I mean, within two elections, Kosovo, changed dramatically the whole political scene that they, they changed uh, the leaders you you see a new um, group of leaders now you know it's and that's all thanks to um people who believe in the system who believe in democratic values who believe that their vote can uh, make the difference and even more uh, that their power is exerted not only once in four years but constantly Sorry, over to you, Gerda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Georgi, perhaps one uh, comment from uh, Mr. Shasha. Yes, so, so yes, yeah, so quickly, um, they, are, they are indeed good news. I mean, if, if you look as, as it was referred to earlier, if, uh, if we look what happened uh, in modern history, let's say in North Macedonia, that is a success story. Um, JJ just commented and mentioned the Kosovo example. Uh, 
Uh, if we look, if we also note last year, a very vibrant, very vibrant political and democratic developments in, in Podgorica and in Tirana, where both capitals were home, were home to large protests and, and democratic uh, and democratic show of displeasure of citizens with, with their government. Th these are all good signs of vibrant democracies in Western, in Western Balkans. However, I, I think that these are rather isolated, isolated episodes rather than, than convincing, convincing arguments that the region is uh, on a right, on a right track. And what does it take? What does it take to, to spur this new wave of democratization? I don't think there is a single, single easy answer, and it cannot be. I mean, democracy is not easy. Democracy is hard. It takes effort. It doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't improve quickly. So it needs continued, continued effort in order to advance and improve democracy from year to year for just a little bit even if just for a little bit. That's first point. Second point is that I think, and I would hear, I would hear like to be proven wrong, but I think that history has shown that, that processes, important processes, uh, do not change in Western Balkans without, without, external, without external attention and external support. So let me put it this way: If it hadn't been, if it hadn't been for Western, for Western allies and Western community, people in the Western Balkans would still be slaughtering themselves with with ethnic conflicts of the of the of the 90s. Um, so whatever progress has happened in Western Balkans, no matter how limited, uh, is thanks to the Western support for the for the region. So my point is that if we want to continue this progress, I cannot see it happening without, without uh, uh, the support of the of the of the in this particular case of the uh, European of the European Union, but obviously also of the, of the United of the United States. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, it's. Uh, very resonating from all of you uh, the the attention that uh, that the EU and the West in general should uh, should pay continue to pay to strengthen democracy in the region. Um, I, I'd like to, for the sake of time, I have many more questions for you, but uh, for the sake of uh, of time, I could perhaps open it. Uh, it to the questions we have now received from uh, from uh, our audience. Um, there's a few questions. I will not perhaps have the time to to ask all of them because there's quite a few, and I apologize in advance to for for those questions that will will not be maybe asked for for the sake of time. Uh, however, perhaps uh, I'll start uh, with the first is a question specific to Kosovo related to improvements in impartiality of public administration administration um, and so the which was illustrated through our GSOD findings and so the question is uh, what are the key changes that led to to this conclusion uh, I believe Genta will take this question thank you Genta. Uh, yeah thank you um, as I've said earlier uh, the impartial administ uh, impartial administration attribute uh, has two sub attributes uh, absence of corruption and predictable enforcement in Kosovo's case, it was an increase uh, in the absence of corruption sub-attribute that led to the overall increase in impartial administration. Uh, more specifically, um, there were two indicators of absence of corruption that had a, a big increase, executive embezzlement and theft, and executive bribery and corrupt exchanges. Um, now, the reasons to that could be related to the new uh, political atmosphere, the new leadership that uh, Demos has mentioned, the strong calls uh, regarding fight against corruption, uh, and then significant anti-corruption legislation that was adopted lately. Um, um, so it is early to say, and the lack of implementation of existing legislation is challenging, but I think when it comes to the political part and the legislation maybe, uh, Demos can 
can discuss that into more detail. Would you like to add any comment, Demush, or should we move to the next question, perhaps? Okay, I think I will uh, move uh, now to the next uh, question, perhaps. Uh, so, civic engagement that was mentioned from uh, uh, several of you. Uh, one of our guests is asking, uh, how can we better support civ uh, civic initiatives that emerge but then fade away? How can we engage better and who can be potential partners? I think um, it's a phenomenon we've witnessed in several countries. Uh, very positive initiatives that uh, spring, but then uh, are not necessarily always sustainable. So, uh, how can we better support them? Well, I can take this question. Um, well, I don't think it's um, it's 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 at it's 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 all a problem that they're not uh, long lasting. They don't have to become NGOs. They don't have to become institutionalized. I think that it's important that they emerge, that they are there, that they self organize, and the support is uh, in in various ways. First, I think um, it's also very indicative also towards the bigger established organizations that. Um, it's a matter of trust uh, and that they are very, that most of these people at the local level are very cautious when it comes to contact with bigger organizations, with donor organizations, because we have certain narratives and unfortunately also certain experiences uh, more and more, especially in, in the country where I speak from, we, we see the emergence of gongos. We even in Serbia, I see the emergence of state-initiated local movements. That's a special phenomenon. Um, so the people are very cautious, uh, and I think that's good because it also shows that they are very aware where they live. Um, we can reach out with uh, providing practical advice, uh, legal advice that's very often needed because they're fighting the, the, on, on, on legal issues and need this advice and of course in in funding and when we speak about funding i think it's more important to support them than to have a logo visibly somewhere because uh, at the local level they have not the means to deal with the communication issues that might come if a bigger logo of again foreign and then we go into this foreign mercenary uh, dialogue and dilemma so um by reaching out actively and whatever you think you can provide um, to help them or also just to share and exchange experiences so that not each local initiative has to do the same mistakes uh, somebody else did. We see that on a regional level, how much they appreciate this kind of really exchange of experiences. So I think there is a number of things where these people at the local level can, can be supported. Thank you. And uh, next, we have a question on uh, uh, how we monitor uh, the state of democracy that concerns uh, minorities in our GSOD. So I guess this question goes for Alberto. Thank you. Um, this is a very good question. Um, the way minorities uh, are um, considered or treated within a Within a given country is monitored um, through one sub attribute, uh, which is social rights and equality. And within that sub attribute, we have a specific measure on social group equality. Social group equality tries to measure uh, to what extent, well, as the name indicates, uh, different social groups. Um, it has to be generic because in some countries we will be speaking about different ethnic groups. In other countries, it will be religious groups. So it varies all over the world, but how equal they are in terms of um, the existence of uh, religious or ethnic tensions, um, the way power is distributed among socioeconomic positions, the representation of disadvantaged communities in um, positions of power, um, the, the existence of um, how power is distributed by social groups, uh, social class equality. So there is a lot of indica different indicators that we aggregate all together um, in order to to get a measure of social group equality. Of course, it's, it's probably one of the most difficult ones to measure because it 
it involves a lot of very complex measurements, but it's also one of the um, one of the indicators that brings uh, that compiles more data. Um, so in general, it tends to fare pretty well um, to to understand um, to what extent minorities do enjoy their rights and their um, uh, yeah, the full citizen citizenship rights in uh, in any given country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto. Then I can uh, perhaps uh, move to the next question. Uh, well, we have a bit of a comparative question here. So. Uh, mm, why have some Balkan countries, uh, such as Albania, Montenegro, Serbia, not managed to enter the EU despite being candidate countries for a long time, while other Balkan countries like Slovenia and Croatia have managed to enter the EU? Uh, I don't know who from the panel would like to comment on this, perhaps. Gergi, over to you. We're, we're speaking about two different times uh, when doing those those comparisons. I mean, of course, progress uh, and all that matters, but uh, there's a little tiny thing in the accession process called, um, you know, um, accession process is technical, but accession is political. So uh, for Slovenia, there was a completely different political momentum um, it was part of the Big Bang, and, and there was an eagerness from the EU, um, etc. Et um, currently, I mean, with all due respect for uh, the issues and the, to do the homeworks and to do lists that we need to do, huh? but uh, still, um, in in the last. 10, 15 years, the appetite from the EU on, on uh, um, enlargement and accession is certainly not the one uh, of the of the Big Bang, right? Uh, during the, the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, so um, it's, it's completely different um, political um, momentum, I would say. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Georgi. Indeed, uh, an important emphasis between uh, finding the right balance but between the to do homework on our plate and then also jumping on the ship or on the train at the right political momentum. Um, uh, perhaps another question um, always with the role of the internationals that was mentioned uh, repeatedly uh, in your in your comments, but more directly related to the impact of the war in Ukraine. Uh, so how has the impact of the war in Ukraine affected the decline of democracy in the Western Balkans? And could the end of the conflict bring back international attention, for example, from the EU and US to the Western Balkan countries? Uh, yes, Simonita, please. Um, to be frank, I don't think that the the war, the invasion of on Ukraine has a very much. You can I don't think you can, you can draw causality with the drop of democracy in in the region, or that it would be a substantial factor because I think we see these trends very much over time. Um, that I mean, they persist over time, uh, and I would, uh, the presentation showed those basically a d decade long trend, which was evident that you, we don't see such big shifts. Although maybe I might be a bit uh, more cautious when I comment here on Serbia, because in Serbia we see a lot of drops in the last year, but I don't think it would be the, the, the war in Ukraine specifically. I mean, I'll kind of go with a disclaimer there. Um, the bigger concern that we have, and that links us to the second part of your question, Blerta, is uh, uh, when we talk about the role of international community, and I think you interpreted my intervention, I think the second one is a call for more, in, for more uh, intervention from Europe. Um, I think maybe here I'm suffering from, my, uh, from being in this process for too long, but these are countries 
that have an accession perspective. So the engagement of, on the side of the European Union needs to come with a mind of supporting future member states. I would not see it as traditionally, maybe in the context that Demos mentioned, that intervention from outside. But I think it's more important how do they actually support the how do they, we build the institutions here so that they will work for us in the next in the next five decades, not not just to patch an issue as sometimes the tendency of solving or intervening will be uh, will be from from the outside uh, from the outside world. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, I'm not sure that in the long run uh we will see what has been hailed as successes of the last year as a contribution to democracy uh, the hailed successes have been the start of the accession negotiations with uh, north macedonia and albania the status of a candidate country to bosnia with all of the contestations and these i think are directly connected to the granting of a candidate status to ukraine and moldova with the much delayed, belated decision on the visa liberalization of Kosovo to come into force no later than 2024. I'm not sure that these will actually, that these steps of the EU, unless we see some major change in their attitude, will actually contribute to a lot of democracy. Maybe if that's not later than 2024, will maybe help to buy some of the legitimacy which is left among the Kosovo public. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there's still many, many questions and I, I apologize again to, to all of you in the audience for not being able to, to ask them within this the, the time frame of, of this panel. So before we wrap up, uh, I would like to ask from each of the speakers one uh, last comment as regards uh, the, the future. So if you could make a forecast, so what is on the horizon uh, for the region? Um, Please, perhaps uh, we follow the, the order of Ms. Tomanich first and then the rest. Thank you. Oh, wow. Well, I, I, I don't like, thank you. I don't like forecasts because, um, uh, yeah, I always leave somehow people in, in bad energy when I make forecasts and predictions. But, um, yeah, I think that we have to be very aware. I think that we have to be very cautious. We are again discussing security issues. We are again uh, speaking about issues. <laughs> thoughts that are in the, in the in the past and that we have overcome them i think that the region is in terrible shape that it's fragile i think that we all know uh who is to blame for that i really hope that the eu is waking up and that the if something is to be drawn from the war uh in ukraine for the balkans that the EU will really wake up because for years, as also Jerzy explained, they were pretending to uh, uh, to enlarge, and we were pretending to exceed. They were silent about political criteria. They um, were silent and blind-eyed on stabilocracies, on state capture. They they were silent um, on what is, for example, happening in Serbia, where media capture is at, at such a level that you that we shouldn't speak about media any longer because it's propaganda and for 10 years the eu silently looks at what is being spoken about the eu and how negative it is pictured and now everybody is surprised that the support uh, rates for eu accession have dropped below 40 percent well it wa was not visible and civil society was raising it but then we were the negative ones the naive ones the ones that don't understand real politic whatever so i think that we have to change and that we have to work that the eu changes its approach because alone i doubt that we will make it honestly thank you Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Kacharska, one last uh, comment, perhaps, sure. on, the future, um, on what I, the future holds for, for the region. 
I can only say what I hope that it holds. I mean, I hope it holds more Democrats than uh, uh, people that are disappointed with democracy. Because just to reflect, there was a here uh, there was a question that said that a lot of the people are actually disappointed. I think this is very much a of what the what these last thirty years have delivered. And I can only say that it. I hope that it brings more people that actually are confident in their own capabilities and uh, have the guts to actually stand up for what they think is right. Thank you very much, Georgie. One of the things I take from from um, your report and and this panel is that. Um, you know, people say that smile are, are contagious. Um, what I can say after reading your report is that uh, democratic decline is more contagious than democratic consolidation. Um, and unfortunately, that's a lesson that we need to keep in mind uh, for the future. Like Alexandra, I wouldn't dare, especially at times like this, to make any predictions. But I can say that there are a couple of issues and, and concerns or challenges that we need to take into account um, while looking at the future. Um, I mean, issues that are relevant for, for democracy and democratic consolidation. Um, let me start with the internal factors uh, initially. Uh, first of all, it will uh, very much depend on how we manage uh, the massive outflow of uh, our citizens, especially youngsters, leaving the country. Uh, secondly, um, democracy will depend a lot on whether we will succeed as a society to, to uh, increase the number of, of people uh, dedicated to fighting democratic values at home. Um, Certainly, there are uh, here. There are the, the issues of uh, rule of, sorry, rule of law, media freedom, um, the re-establishment of checks and balances. I know Demos mentioned a bit, but that's a very important, um, uh, very important uh, ingredient. Uh, that I don't know how we should do it. Huh? I I fully agree with Alexandra that um, the call of uh, European Commission. Uh, directed at the governments to please uncapture the state will not work. Huh? Let's let's be aware about that. Um, um, civic space, um, media freedom, and so on. But there is also a number of external factors that we um, need to consider, and that unfortunately democracy in the region will depend on 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 that as well. First, it will depend also on how the EU and the West reacts to Russian aggression. Uh, the Russian aggression is is the biggest um, uh, security development uh, of of contemporary uh, of of nowadays time, and and is a massive uh, test, um, among other things, also about democracy. Secondly, it will depend how the EU and the West respond responds also to growing influence um, from competing powers like China. Uh, thirdly, uh, it we need to consider also um, whether the West or the EU will declare democracy in the Western Balkans a national security objective for themselves. Let's uh, let's not um, let's not fool ourselves. Uh, the fact that uh, Russia is here today is in part also because it was led um, the, to 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 reach to to this position. It was ignored. It was sometimes even financed uh, by the EU, and that's something that should not uh, should not uh, be tolerated anymore. Uh, so basically uh, doing the same as the U US did for the corruption and anti-corruption. They declared it uh, a priority of their uh, uh, strategic interests. Um, finally, it will also depend on how the EU will solve some of the issues in its own backyard. And let's start with democratic decline in some of the EU member states. How the EU will address this issue, it's important because, as I said, democratic decline is contagious. And if you look at the data presented at the beginning, 
uh, the Balkans, Western Balkans is declining in all components where Central Europe is declining itself. So um, it will be very difficult for the EU to impose itself as an actor in the region uh, as on matters that EU itself has failed. Uh, lastly, um, No, I think I think I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. More more comments in the next uh, in the future panels. Uh, and lastly, Mr. Sasha, please. Well, look under under normal circumstances, where European continent is not under war, I would have many things to say about the future of our region the economy, the youth, the education, etc. But under these circumstances, I have to say only one simple thing. The future of the Western Balkans will be determined in Ukraine. Ukrainian glorious victory will bring blossoming future for, for our region. Ukrainian defeat will bring a very grave uh, future for Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Shashan, to all the panelists. Um, uh, a lot of important messages were, were given today. Um, and um, I, I, it's, yeah, it's hard for me to, to wrap them all up, but uh, I think a few of the things that uh, um, came out very clearly is are that uh, well number one that democracy is under threat and in decline uh, globally and is no longer to be taken for granted even um, in Western consolidated uh, countries uh, including in, in those uh, you know in the long-standing democracies of, of Europe and uh, we heard today that also uh, predictably the Western Balkans are no exception to this. On the contrary, uh, uh, some issues which were pre-existing have been exacerbated and these uh, were repeatedly mentioned among these state capture, media capture, corruption, uh, immigration, widespread immigration of, of especially of youth, but even some security issues that uh, we thought we had overcome were, were are back, are back uh, to trouble the uh, the, the fragile democracies of, of the Western Balkans. Um, in positive news, if I were to draw a balance, I think we also heard uh, uh, some encouraging messages. Uh, we, we heard examples of how there is potential, there is movement, there is potential within civil society. There are issues uh, that uh, are, are proving to be uniting across the region, such as the need for climate action. There are also encouraging examples of ability to, to improve democracy and institutions um, in North Macedonia, in Kosovo. So, so there are improvements, but uh, we also heard today that uh, these improvements take time. And uh, I believe uh, one overarching remark uh, among all speakers was the fact that still um, history in the region shows that uh, you know still the role of of western act actors uh, is is determinant uh, in the support of democracies uh, in uh, in the region western actors will continue to to play a role i think we heard uh, uh, repeatedly that the region has been in the waiting line for EU accession for, for a while now. Uh, and so perhaps this, um, uh, this moment, which is also historically crucial, uh, where um, there is, a, as one of the speakers put it, uh, there is a battle for democracy being played out uh, in, in Ukraine and democracy must win. Um, so it's also a historic moment also for, for the EU to re-examine uh, perhaps it's its role and, and engagement and leverage in the Western Balkans region um, as well. Um, and with these uh, final reflections, which I hope uh, summarize some of the, <laughs> the core messages that were sent here today, uh, I'd like to thank again uh, all the speakers, um, uh, the speakers that uh, are here in this panel, uh, Simonida, Demos, Djerji, uh, Alexandra just left us. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Giulio Veneri, 
who was with us uh, here earlier, uh, and also my colleagues, uh, uh, Sam, uh, Alberto, Genta, for all the insights of on our work that they provided. Uh, thank you very, very much to all of you that logged in to, to listen to, to and to ask questions uh, to this panel today and um, stay tuned for more discussions uh, in the future. Uh, and with this, I would like to close the event for today. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.